Hello, everyone. Today we have Mark Birch with us. Mark is a community builder, a software entrepreneur, a business development expert, and is the author of an amazing book called Community in a Box. He's a principal startup advocate at Amazon Web Services, AWS, across Asia Pacific and Japan. Mark, welcome to our show. Welcome, glad to be here and really looking forward to the conversation. <laughs> Likewise, Mark. So uh, you're currently working at AWS and you tend to share a lot of stories of how founders across um, the, the Asia Pacific uh, region benefit from building and scaling their startups on AWS. Uh, in that capacity, you tend to create a lot of content. Uh, some of the content that I have been hearing uh, from you on Clubhouse is really awesome. So could you speak about your experience of this fascinating journey that you have been on? Sure. Uh, well, I guess I could speak of how I got to AWS because most of my background has been uh, in startups in the more recent decade. So I had, I've been a founder. Mm -hmm. at a HR tech company that was focused on workforce analytics. And I've been an angel investor. Uh, I've been a startup advisor to many B2B tech startups, mostly focused in the New York City tech ecosystem. And prior to AWS, I was at Stack Overflow. So some of your listeners may know Stack Overflow. If you have ever touch code, you're a developer, there's a pretty good chance that you Googled something when you had an error or an issue and you came up with this thing called Stack Overflow, which is this great repository of knowledge around all things programming. So I was there for a while. And for me, being part of startup communities has just been like so integral to my existence and what gets me excited and passionate. And when I left Stack Overflow, I was gonna go out on my own. And it was just in that transition time when a friend of mine who I was working with, he was a head of innovation at a big bank. He had gone over to AWS, uh, heading up uh, one of the FinTech uh, groups, he reached out to me and said, hey, Mark, uh, there's this role and it seems to be all about you. Like you are this role. And I said, uh, Nelson, uh, that's cool and all, but it's AWS, I'm a startup guy. He's like, no, no, it's, it's for a startup advocate. I'm like, oh, well, okay, that, that's interesting, but I don't know. Yeah, I mean, every startup I know is running on AWS pretty much, but uh, I didn't think it, AWS really focused on, on startups so much. I think it was just kind of like a default option. But, uh, but Nelson said, no, just take a look at the job description, and let me know, and, and you know, submit your, your resume if you think it's going to be something you want to want to explore. And I said, okay, well, I was still very, uh, very heads down thinking about doing my own thing. But I said, okay, let me just send it in. Let me just give this a chance and see what may come of it. And I talked to the guy who was basically the startup advocate, global startup advocate for AWS for five years. And we instantly hit it off. I was like, wow, this guy, he, he gets it. He's been in startups. He was in places like Tumblr, uh, heading up engineering. He was at Oscar Health, Betterment. Like, he gets startups and he gets what they need. And we were just very much were simpatico. And so I was like, okay, maybe, maybe this is worthwhile. If he could be at AWS for five years, maybe I should give this a shot. And so I went through the whole process, uh, they call it a loop. So for folks who have ever been in AWS hiring process, you know that uh, the hiring process is pretty rigorous. Uh, they go through a whole series of interviews. They really drill down into these things called leadership principles, which are the, the 16 core principles that Amazonians work by and really defines how we get things done. And so it was a very rigorous interview process, but I got through and they gave me an offer to be the startup advocate for Asia Pacific Japan based in Singapore. Now, I'm not doing this, uh, this podcast right now from Singapore. I'm actually in New Jersey. So what happened was when I got the offer from AWS, I was in Singapore at the time. This was late March, 2020. And I'm looking at the news reports of what's going on in the US with COVID and it's just, 
it's unreal. And I was like, well, I, I really got to go back. I got to get my family and I can't get started, you know, anyway. So I have to go back just for the visa mm -hmm. process to work its way. So I accepted the offer, uh, moved up my, my flight to Wednesday of that week. Uh, re didn't, re didn't even realize that that was the last United <laughs> airline flight that was going between Singapore and the US. They were closing down the route that day. What an and so, coincidence. so I didn't even realize that. And, uh, and like the, the flight was full of like United employees going back to the U S from Singapore. Uh, the flight, by the way, just as an aside, the flight from San Francisco to New York was about the emptiest flight I've ever been in my entire life. I mean, there was more people, uh, more flight attendants <laughs> than, and crew than actual passengers. So I got back to the U S and then a week later, Singapore goes on a two month lockdown and like everyone's scrambling, go, well, how's Mark going to start? And so they just shifted the role to have me start in the U S. So that's a little bit of my journey of getting to AWS. Uh, and you know, it's been, a, it's been an interesting year plus since I've come on board. Uh, it definitely has the, the benefits of being in a startup in many ways. Sure. But also the benefits of being in a big global company where you have just a lot of resources and a lot of recognition that definitely helps to get things done. Absolutely. I think uh, AWS is where all the cloud uh, entrepreneurs, I mean, the SaaS entrepreneurs are very much aware of. Uh, everyone is building their tech stack or at least yeah. you know, engaging with the AWS ecosystem. So that's always there. Uh, good to know that. Um, so is, it, is your base um, uh, still uh, rooted in Singapore? I mean, eventually you will be coming back to Singapore at a, at, a, at a later point in time, maybe next year. Is that the case? It, it's, still, it's still an option. Okay. Now, <laughs> that's not really, look, we're still, we're still, still in a very fluid situation. But with countries now opening up and now Singapore is opening up these travel lanes, I think sometime next year I'll be, uh, in Singapore, it may be like a multi-stage thing, who knows? <laughs> but right now, what's interesting is that even with my initial focus being Asia Pacific, sure. a lot of my work ends up being global. And mm -hmm. a lot of that is due to things like Clubhouse, where yeah. the audience could be listening in from anywhere in the planet and often is. I get listeners yeah. from uh, Africa, a lot of Africa, like startup founders, uh, folks all obviously throughout Asia as well as Europe, uh, the Americas. So it's a very much a global audience that we end up attracting for the shows. Sure. And uh, I'm just curious, what, what really led you to uh, be long on uh, the audio space in Clubhouse? I mean, you know, you could have experimented with a bunch of other things. Your blog is a super hit as well. You manage uh, your blog for the last, how many years? I think DevWiz Ops, it's been there for almost like, close to a decade, if I'm not wrong. No, not a decade. Uh, <laughs> more, more like four years. I started four years, yeah? when I was okay. at a, when I was at Stack Overflow, uh, sure. which is like a whole nother story. But no, it has been going on for a while. I, I think I've had like two hundred posts, so it's sure. definitely definitely has a pretty regular cadence. Sure, uh, and that doesn't even include the other blog newsletter I do, which is called the Enterprise Sales Forum. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so, and again, that's another story, a community I started, uh, but that was for enterprise salespeople, people that were selling like in the B2B space, uh, because that was my background as mm -hmm. a founder, uh, having to figure out how to sell to big companies mm -hmm. and what that whole process was like. Sure. And so when I started advising startup founders, a lot of them came from product and engineering and didn't have sales experience. So I just said, hey, you know, why don't we just get together? Instead of me giving you all this advice one-to-one, -one, we can all do it as a group. Wouldn't that be True. more scalable and fun? Hey, well, we can have beers and have like food and we can just chat about all the different challenges that we're facing. And that just ended up building out into another whole group. And so around that, I have a newsletter. So it's, you know, very much, it's similar to dev biz ops, yep. but the focus is not, you know, instead of engineering leadership, it's focused mm -hmm. on, sales professionals so yeah I a think lot of content that, yeah so there are a lot of um, uh, global sales communities i think i think uh, pavilion is also one of uh, very famous one mm -hmm. in, in the us i think um, 
previously they were called as uh, revenue revenue um, something and uh, they just recently changed its name to pavilion so uh, i'm just curious like um, for the last 7 8 months you have been very active on clubhouse and talking to a lot of people globally from you know making a lot of rooms etc mm-hmm. so you are very long on the audio space it seems to me so uh, <laughs> what are your thoughts on the, those i mean uh, you could have st- you could have operated in other platforms as well maybe maybe video youtubing or or let's say a lot of uh, other blogging or twitter uh, platforms but uh, clubhouse especially why so it's a uh, it's because i have a face for radio <laughs> good one <laughs> no it's a uh, it, it really does have that radio feel and i'm not sure uh, how many folks have spent any any time at all listening to radio but radio was very this was very integral to my my upbringing and background uh, mm-hmm. because radio was like the place you went to to like to find new music sure uh and you know maybe i'm a, a bit older than a lot of the folks who might be listening but uh you know i grew up with radio i would always uh, write down what the top 100 songs of the of the year were and i i had that kind of as like a uh like a, a zine or like a, a fan magazine and i would have mm-hmm. like a, i had a like fan magazine when i was growing up that I would produce and it would have like you know what was new in music So like radio was always like a thing I was fascinated about and radio shows and and the banter. And fast forward, you know, several decades later, you know, we have video. So why doesn't everyone just do video? Sure. But I look at video as very it's a much higher heavier lift. Mm-hmm. You know, you got to think about the the production values, not only just of the audio but the video quality and there's just a lot more moving parts with it. And for me, I just said, well, why When, isn't it just easier to just have a conversation like we're doing right now absolutely without all of that that extra heavy lifting of video which i think creates a very different dynamic i think video certainly works well you know i have a lot of my colleagues at aws that do some wonderful twitch streams for example mm-hmm. or a few that have some pretty uh, fast growing uh, youtube followings but for me in particular when i when i heard about clubhouse and i started using it earlier in the year mm-hmm. it really just sparked something in my mind it said look this is really super fascinating uh people are getting on and doing this thing on clubhouse and it's and it's so easy just to get on and to and to have really meaningful conversations and engage with people that are listening And that was the thing that I thought was even more fascinating. In my role as a startup advocate, a lot of what is important for us is this idea of engaging. Yeah. You know, how do we get people to, to come into the fold? You don't even have to be part of AWS. It's like just you're interested in startups, you're interested in cloud technologies, you're mm-hmm. interested in innovation. Sure. Okay, great. Let, let's have a conversation. Maybe AWS can be part of part of what helps you to build whatever it is that you have. Mm-hmm. And that was what was wonderful about Clubhouse that you can have these spontaneous rooms, you can maybe schedule them out, whatever your process was, you can have these really wonderful enriching conversations with whomever sure. anywhere around the planet. And it was great that just listening to different rooms, you would have uh CEOs of like pretty like far along companies i remember uh, one conversation in particular the cto of of zero the big accounting firm right and mm-hmm. just it was, he was on i just found it randomly <laughs> and it was such an awesome conversation and that's what really clicked for me is this could be such a great mechanism for us as aws and the aws startups team to connect with folks that are just curious about you know building startups building in the cloud that we can invite people that are building on the cloud to share some of their stories about uh why they started their startup what were some of the lessons learned mm-hmm. and build that as a community and that was the the second thing that I thought was really interesting about clubhouse is that there's a lot of different places you can uh do audio spaces now Yeah. It's not just Clubhouse and we do Absolutely. I do keep my eye to what's going out on out there in 
with the different trends and the different tools that are out there. But yeah, Clubhouse definitely had this concept of community building built in mm -hmm. from the get go. And that's mm -hmm. what's interesting. And so from middle of March of this year till now, we now have uh, 6,700 members of our community in the AWS Startups Club. Mm -hmm. And that's just a real, that's just a start. You want to be able to grow out that community. Uh, we also want to be able to do different things. So really think about the long term about how to build, grow, and scale community, something that I'm very passionate about, yeah. and be able to do that in, in different medium as well. Like so mm -hmm. Clubhouse is, is really kind of the, the first leg of a of a bigger vision. Mm -hmm. One of our leadership principles at AWS is think big. Yeah. Right. And we have plenty of there's plenty of think big ideas. You know, some of them you know weren't so hot. Some of them have been, been uh, have been just revolutionary. I mean, mm -hmm. AWS itself mm -hmm. was a think big idea. What if we took all this extra server capacity now that we've rearchitected Amazon.com mm -hmm. and we've built out this this microservices architecture? It's very uh, services based, and we've decoupled everything. But now we have all this extra capacity. What do we do with that? Mm -hmm. That was a think big idea that you know, certainly has, has revolutionized the way that we think about compute and the way that we think about building from the ground mm -hmm. up. Uh, so you know, my, my think big idea is that we can, we can coalesce this, this momentum around Clubhouse mm -hmm. to create an incredibly engaging community Mm -hmm. That can be of value to all startup founders. Wow, that is that is that's so good to hear. To be honest, Mark, <laughs> and uh, rightly, uh, you you touched upon your favorite topic actually, community building, right? I mean, you are you you absolutely <laughs> yeah. love that. You've written a book as well, um, Community in a Box. Uh, talk us through, you know, some of the salient pointers of uh, Community in a Box. And, ah, I see the book as well. <laughs> So I think uh, you published it um, uh, last year, if I'm not wrong, and um, mm -hmm. uh, many of the folks have been reading it, uh, and they would be giving a lot of amazing reviews around that as well. So what are some of the, let's say, top three uh, salient pointers that you tell to our listeners? I mean, top notch uh, pointers from your book, Community in a Box, if I may ask. Sure. Three things. It always comes down to three things. Uh... <laughs> let's make it five then. Uh, this is uh, this will be interesting. All right, the very first thing, whether we do you know three, five, ten, whatever, the very first thing is you gotta ask yourself why. Mm -hmm. Why, from your perspective, because community building is super hard. If you're going to build something from scratch, it's just like a startup. Absolutely, like you got to be passionate about it, and if you're not passionate about it is a slog. It is, there's a lot of not fun aspects about community building. Mm -hmm. We just got to get that off the, off the plate immediately. It's, it is a really heavy involved task mm -hmm. because there's a lot of ups and downs. You know, yep. you will hit the highs, but then you, you will hit the trial of sorrows. So understand why this community is important for you. Mm -hmm. And the flip side, understand why a community is important for the people that you want to be involved in the community. I often talk about this concept of with them, mm -hmm. what's in it for me? Mm -hmm. And you really got to kind of flip that on its head and understand from your, the potential member's perspective, why do they think the community is important for them? So that's sure. number one. The second thing is, I mentioned the, the highs and lows of community building. Mm -hmm. And there'll be a time when you launch where it's really exciting and it's super feels super awesome. Yeah. And then things are gonna start like getting off track, mm -hmm. gonna hit some snags. You know, you're gonna have like a few maybe like really awesome events or things that happen, and then people drop off, there's less momentum, and you start to you know go from those highs. Then you go all the way down to the trial of sorrows and you think, oh my God, I, I, maybe this community is not for me. Maybe, it's, maybe I should give it up. And that is the exact wrong time to give up. And it's because a large part of community building, which I think is, is lost on many, many folks, 
is consistency. Mm. That is the, the that's the big C word of community. It's consistency. Mm. And the reason I, I mentioned consistency is that it's hard to, if you always have a short-term view, to understand or to kind of see what the light is at the end of the tunnel. Mm -hmm. And so if you're always thinking about the short-term and short-term results, whenever you hit a snag or roadblock, you're going to think that's it. Because you haven't really thought about what the long-term looks like. So you want to set up your community to, to grow and scale in your favor. And the way you're going to do that is understanding that if you set up whatever you're doing from a long-term perspective, so what that means practically speaking is if you, if you create events and that events are the big driver for your community mm -hmm. and for community engagement, don't schedule the first, you know, one event or two or three events, schedule out for the next six months. Mm -hmm. And that may seem like really far and away. It may seem like way extra planning that's necessary, but I will tell you from experience, setting that six month plus plan mm -hmm. helps you so much in thinking about how to get through the, the struggles that you have sometimes in the middle part of building community. So you have hope, you have, uh, you can keep the faith and you have that vision, that North star mm -hmm. that pulls you along. So that's the second part. You got to be consistent. And just as a point of reference with Clubhouse, for example, with Clubhouse, what we did was, even though it, it can be helter-skelter with the scheduling, because I'm working with lots of different teams across AWS, uh, we knew that we had to do a show every Tuesday, Thursday at 6 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. Pacific. Mm -hmm. uh, same in EMEA. So we have a show that is uh, 11 a.m. Eastern, uh, 4 p.m. London time every Monday, Wednesday. And we stuck with that schedule. Mm -hmm. And we just figured out, like, if we didn't have, like, a guest, then we'll just fill in with some other topic. But having that consistency was so integral to getting to where we are now with the size of community that we're at. Sure. And just for a point of reference, like, how many shows have we done so far? Mm -hmm. We've done 150 shows since mm -hmm. starting, the, starting the regular shows back in March of this year. Whoa. 150 shows so maybe we've gone a bit overboard and obviously had like <laughs> other people helping out yeah. uh in in EMEA in APJ uh, a lot of contributors but that's what that's what consistency means mm -hmm. it means doing something on a regular basis and committing to it mm -hmm. so the third thing that I'll wrap up with here is uh Think about community as a flywheel. Hmm. If you have that long-term perspective, what is going to be the things that create the momentum sure. so that it builds upon itself over time? And that's going to be incredibly important because what the flywheel does, and just for a point of reference, we talk a lot about flywheels at Amazon. Mm -hmm. And that was really the early driver for creating growth. Mm -hmm. And if you look at, if you, look up Amazon flywheel, do a search, you'll see kind of like these early like chicken scratch drawings, <laughs> of like a wheel and things spinning off and yeah. things about pricing and quality and all that. Uh, those were all great mm -hmm. in terms of building up Amazon's business. And it did create the momentum to get to where we are today. Mm -hmm. Community is also a flywheel mm -hmm. and you need that flywheel as you start to grow and scale the community and go from that, that nascent launch period. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's gonna, be, it's gonna be super hard to continue the growth because you'll always be doing things manually and you'll just continue to struggle. And over mm -hmm. time, you should struggle less as a community founder. And I look at the community flywheel from three specific mechanisms. The first is you gotta have content. Content's value. That's what people are interested in. You know, it could be uh, your webinars, your podcasts, your blog, whatever it is. Sure. It starts with content. It could be Q&A. Mm -hmm. But you also need to get people excited about something. 
you know, it's hard to get excited about blogs and newsletters. <laughs> so what is that? What is building anticipation? I call that events. Mm -hmm. Now events could be a regularly scheduled uh, podcast. It could be clubhouse shows. It could be whatever it is, but something that gets a large group of people together mm -hmm. to consume content mm -hmm. at one time and enable some engagement. So that's an event. And sure. hopefully as we get post COVID, we'll be doing more <laughs> events in person, which would be sure. wonderful. Yeah. Then the third part of that, that whole flywheel comes into this concept of content. And I mean, not content, so I'm getting distracted. There's the first one. <laughs> I, I get like, like the notifications come from like all different <laughs> angles here. But the, uh, the third is peer to peer engagement. Sure. So what I mean by that is a community is not just a, it's not an audience. Like people build Good. audiences. Like if you are, you know, if you're a musician, you want fans. That's sure. great. But that conversation is very unidirectional. Mm -hmm. And it's very much you to them, one sure. to many. Yeah. Community is very different. The way community works is that it's a network of people coming together that yeah. many to many dynamic and the reason community works and creates so much value is this idea called Metcalfe's law. Mm -hmm. Now Metcalfe's law, if you know anything about the engineering world and mm -hmm. the, the world of ethernet, mm -hmm. Robert Metcalfe was the inventor of ethernet mm -hmm. and his, his law was when you connect lots of different nodes in a network together, you create exponential value. Sure. They're called the, like the N squared theory. Mm -hmm. Well, the same happens with people. You connect two people together. Okay, that's interesting. You connect five, more interesting. You connect millions or billions. Mm -hmm. You create immense amount of value. And you look at social sure. networks today. Yeah. And that is what you see. You see, okay, LinkedIn, for example. It's a network of 700 million plus people around the planet, mm -hmm. all around professional interests. Mm -hmm. Well, so when you're thinking about community, you really got to think about how do you, how do you enable all those one-to-one -one engagements with people mm -hmm. in a many-to-many -many network of relationships. And so creating mechanisms allow for people to reach out to each other mm -hmm. and build those relationships. That's what drives even more value mm -hmm. because they get more involved and they may want to become content contributors. They may want to volunteer. Mm -hmm. And so now you get more content because you have mm -hmm. more people that are active and engaged. Sure. That goes to your events. Yeah. That brings more people to want to engage on a one-to-one -one basis and mm -hmm. to build that peer engagement and increase the value exponentially. Yeah. So that's the third part. So yeah. uh, when you think about community long-term, you want to grow and scale, you really got to enable that flywheel to work. The flywheel mm -hmm. that contains content, creates anticipation through events and enables peer-to-peer -peer engagement. Absolutely. I absolutely love the third part uh, that you rightly mentioned. It's about... Content, definitely, yes, you need to have good content. And um, and secondly, you'll have to have or curate amazing events as well, whether what, whichever platform you are using. It could be, let's say, Clubhouse, or it could be a bunch of other, other networks people have been using, let's say, on Bevy, on Mighty Networks, and uh, yeah. other, other platforms as well, Circle.so, etc. The third one was very interesting, and that really piqued my interest, is because you're talking about a very complex um, thing happening in that flywheel, right? So, so usually people join communities for transformation. You know, they want to be associated to a particular community or they join a particular community because they want to have a transformation. Let's say they are at, at one, they want to go to 10. And to enable people to go through that transformation from one to 10, or let's say 10 to 100, you need to have a lot of stronger peer-to-peer -peer engagement where all these nodes yeah. of the network needs to be connected and you know the flywheel effect or the network effect really kicks in over there now that's that's an interesting one uh if i were to ask you mark how do you create that element of peer you know stronger peer-to-peer -peer engagement because community is not an audience right uh, clubhouse many people say that of course it's it's a club club has a lot of uh, community members but Primarily, sometimes it becomes an audience, right? You are on a show, there are a lot of people just listening in, you know, silently, passively. So it just becomes an audience. But a stronger community is created only when you have stronger peer-to-peer -peer bonds, where people trust each other within that community because they're 
either there is a strong gated paywall to you know have access to that particular community or uh, the curation has been done so amazingly by the community members that every node within that particular network is really strong enough to add value to the community as well so i just want to know is there an architecture to build this stronger node or or you know peer to peer network because you have a strong experience uh, in the community just not from aws but stack overflow is a great community as well right people who are just starting off they absolutely love it and uh, you know yeah. that a community is good when people really vouch for it right they they exactly. tell their friends they tell their relatives that hey you should also join that so just wanted to know your thoughts on that as well so i'll touch a little bit on on that last part uh and maybe work backwards uh you know community is working when the word of mouth mm -hmm. takes hold. In Stack Overflow is a perfect example. Joel and Jeff, who are the founders of Stack Overflow, had yeah. very uh, well-read blogs in the developer community. Mm -hmm. When they announced they were doing Stack Overflow, they had 30,000 people that joined that community right off the, get, right off the bat, like first day. And wow. it, was, it was amazing. But what was more amazing is those early users led to mm -hmm. having 1 million users in one year from 30,000 wow. to 1 million, right? Because it was powered by word of mouth. So mm. never discount the value of word of mouth. When you're doing something good, mm -hmm. people talk about it and people sure. want their friends and colleagues to be part of it. And that's an important dynamic because going back to the, the crux of your question, it's you know, how do you, how do you create that peer to peer engagement? Yeah. yeah. And I will say that a couple of key foundational theories around community building are important here. The first is not everyone's going to be engaged mm. because they want to just consume. Yeah. And you got to create it and you got to create an environment that is okay with that. I think Stack Overflow, we're, we're fine with people just not with no username, uh, accessing Stack Overflow, mm -hmm. and just maybe pulling some code or getting some knowledge and then going their, their separate ways. Sure. And we're totally fine with that because you got to create that environment that lets people in the door to see mm -hmm. what the community is about and understand what the value is. Now, some of those people are going to say, wow, that's super valuable. And I kind of feel like I want to be part of that. Mm -hmm. So they'll take the next stage and maybe they'll be, you know, moderately involved. Maybe they'll, you know, write some comments. Mm -hmm. They'll maybe upvote some things. Maybe they'll even ask a question. Mm -hmm. and, but that may not be on like all the time doing stuff. Sure. But there's going to be that small percentage that are going to, they're going to look at the stack overflow. They're going to get involved and they're going to have the bug that just mm. drives them to want to get more and more involved. They want to be part of the game or they mm -hmm. want to be involved in the community. They want to be, you know, in that discussion. So sure. they, they dive in a little bit deeper and they become even more, uh, uh, more common contributors, mm. they get more engaged. Mm -hmm. Maybe they even like at, at some level down, down the road, they become a moderator. And the reason I, I mm. talk about this kind of this, this progression is because that's how often people get involved in communities. Hmm. Most people are going to be lurkers and <laughs> a lot of social networking theory uh, basically lays out that your community will generally have a, a you know, a 90, nine, one ratio. And they, there's a rule, the rule of 90, nine, one, Whoa. where 90% or even like greater will be lurkers. They're not going to be involved. 9% will be moderately involved. 1% will be the super users or the, the super fans. Mm. And so when you think about community, you don't worry so much about the 90. You give them opportunities mm. to observe, to be, to listen mm. in. Got it. To engage where they, they feel comfortable engaging. But yep. your real community is that 1%. Because that's what drives mm. all, a large percentage of the engagement in your community. So you really got to focus on your fans. And for Clubhouse, that's a good example um, where everyone thinks, oh, it's just an audience. 
But in mm -hmm. fact, there's a really interesting dynamic because if you do things with consistency, you mm -hmm. remember the, the second part of what I mentioned yeah. before about the three things to yeah. share about community. If you do things in a consistent manner, people are like, wow, this is really cool. And I want to listen in some more. And maybe I have mm -hmm. some questions. And so what you see is you have these regular listeners on mm -hmm. our clubhouse shows for the AWS sure. Startups Club that are there almost every show. Mm. And they share the show with their networks, their people that they follow. Mm -hmm. Like, hey, there's this really great thing that AWS is doing and Mark is hosting. You sure. Check it out. So they start sharing. And so you have word of mouth. Absolutely. And that really is a community dynamic. Now, does Clubhouse do a really great job with like the one-to-one -one engagement? Not yeah. so much. I mean, back channel, wave. <laughs> I mean, I think they're interesting. Yeah. Uh, people certainly are using them. Yeah. But I wouldn't necessarily call that a great mechanism for for that peer-to-peer -peer engagement. You really need maybe something else in addition sure. to Clubhouse or in addition to other channels that you're working with mm -hmm. to to bring people in the fold to have those ongoing discussions where people can really really can connect one to one and build those those relationships. Uh, and that mean that may mean uh, having another place. Mm -hmm. You know, and that could be you know some of those tools that you mentioned. I know a lot of folks do things on Discord or Slack. Yeah. Uh, so that's also kind of the, the long-term thinking is understanding just from like a, a channel and a platform perspective as you're building community. Sure. Uh, where does your community mostly live? Mm -hmm. right. something, that, that, something important to think about is you start to activate the three components of the community flywheel. Mm -hmm. Content, like where, events, yeah, where, and then peer-to-peer -peer engagement, yeah? Yeah, where are you doing these things? Sure. You know, and does it make sense to do all these things in kind of one thing, one platform? Yeah. Probably not. You know, when I was doing the enterprise sales forum, those mm -hmm. were in-person events. Hmm. Right. And yes, the content was that, the peer-to-peer -peer engagement was that. But we sure. also recognize that there need to be a, a, a thing between events. Mm -hmm to keep people connected to what was going on in the broader community. And that's when the newsletter started. Sure. Yeah, I think uh, both since last year, there are a lot of digital communities that are sprouting in different parts of the world. Yeah, uh, yeah I mean, of course, the, the, like you rightly mentioned, Slack, Discord, Discourse, and a lot of, lot of other tools that have been currently being used to uh, you know, activate communities. But as you rightly mentioned in the very start, uh, community building is really tough. It's complex. It's not easy. People give up even after a few months or years because, because like you said, right? 90% of the people, I love that rule that you had, 99 and one. 90% of the people in the communities are lurkers. So what happens is that sometimes uh, the, the highly enthusiast um, are getting demotivated because there's a huge population of lurkers in the community, right? It's, we are just consuming content, not contributing a lot. So that sometimes impact the morals or... So what I'm thinking is that, is there a possibility that if you gamify the system and you give um, awards or prizes or swags to the first 1% or maybe include the other 9% as well, that would uh, really trigger the lurkers who are in that 90% range to be much more active and uh, try to come in the next two tiers and try to moderate or actively involve in the community. Just curious. Yeah. No, it definitely is. It's uh, the a lot of this actually starts with the those true fans that that one percent, mm -hmm. uh, because you're creating not only a community but you're creating a culture. Wow. And so if you go back to the first principles. The community is really just a gathering of people that have common interests and values. Sometimes I think we forget about the values part of that definition. Yeah. And so as you're building a community, you really got to think about what are the values that are important that you mm -hmm. want to foster? You know, so for mm -hmm. example, in the communities I foster, a, a very significant, a very key part of those tenants, mm -hmm. the beliefs that we have about what this community represents, mm -hmm. is that it should be opening, welcoming, and inclusive. So sure. we focus on diversity, equity, inclusion from the get-go. Yeah. 
so you got to really think about those tenants or mm-hmm. those beliefs that mm-hmm. set and form the culture. And the fans are going to be the, they're going to be the essentially the enforcers of that community mm-hmm. and of the culture. Sure. Reinforcing those principles that you, that you start off with. Mm-hmm. So if you don't have the, the right people doing that role of mm-hmm. forming and setting that culture, mm-hmm. then things will go awry very quickly. Okay? And you're, you're going to have what generally happens is that you have a community of people that are super engaged, mm-hmm. but they close off themselves to all the other people, to all the lurkers are moderately involved and becomes this, this, this micro community yeah that becomes very uh very antagonistic to newcomers and sometimes Mm. stack overflow has been accused of being a little bit like that Mm. um i'm not necessarily saying yes or no to that but what i would say is that you know those appearances and the the way those those super fans or the the very involved user of the community how they engage with others outside of that that small network or cadre of of other top users Mm -hmm. that could have an impact so you got to make sure you get that culture right at the very start and if you do then those super fans those top users top members they become your best ambassadors for bringing people into the fold getting people to volunteer to contribute yeah Yeah. Uh, and that's really the most important part about thinking about how to get people involved make it welcoming yeah and create and enable people to be ambassadors yeah. or what the community stands for. And then there's other things that you, from a tactical standpoint, yes, you can gamify things. I mean, Stack Overflow has kind of popularized that idea of using badges and reputation points to get people yeah. to want to be involved. Yeah. Uh, I think helping people understand what good contributions are mm-hmm. can be super helpful in elevating those sure. uh, out to the broader community. It's like, hey, you know, we want to recognize... Uh, you know, Shatish over here who had this really great contribution or, or Sarah who wrote this really great post. Sure. So you want to elevate those so people understand what good content looks like and what right. good contributions really uh, do. But that also creates another thing because it, it sets in people's minds like, okay, this is something, this is how I can be involved. Hmm. So it opens up the pathways for people to want to engage. Sure. And, and the last thing I would say is it, depending on the, the nature of type of community, there's definitely ways that you can uh, incentivize, mm-hmm. even beyond just gamification, incentivize people to be involved. So this is when you can uh, think about maybe bringing in partners or other organizations mm-hmm. to offer prizes, awards, recognition, sure. uh, opportunities. You know, oftentimes when I would work with companies that would want to build their own internal communities, mm-hmm. I would say, you know, the easiest thing to do for developers is get them passes to to tech events. Yeah. And you might think, oh, yeah, expensive <laughs> tickets, why not? But that has such an impact yeah. on on how developers like experience and feel about their employer and their work. Sure. Uh, so and you can do these things and they, they really are low cost when you think about the ultimate value that it creates because it gets people to want to be engaged and to sure. want to dive deep in the community. Absolutely. I think I um, loved few of our um, amazing um, thoughts that you shared, right? One is uh, setting the culture code really right in the early days by recruiting the first set of ambassadors or moderators who will really set the direction for the community. And um, uh, secondly, uh, you said something that really picked my interest that a lot, a lot of SaaS founders are really um, going the path of um, a community-led growth. Like previously, it was like sales-led growth, and there was product-led yeah. growth. Now they are realizing that you know, if you build a community today, if you are building a product for sales uh, professionals or let's say the software community uh, members, then the easiest way is that if you can nurture the community for a few months or years, then the, your first employees. Your uh, first referrals, your first members of um, uh, the product users can be your community yeah. members itself. So community-led growth is really taking off. And I just wanted to know some of your thoughts on a new concept that is coming in the world of community, which is like um, uh, centralized and decentralized community. So previously, a lot of um, uh, you know uh, enterprise communities are very centralized. So they, they are hosted within the entity. 
and uh, you have a community manager overseeing the work or you know moderating the activities within the community and uh, and it it is usually sponsored by the company that they are hosted within right mm-hmm. uh, and these are very famous ones trailblazer from uh, salesforce is also a great community and a lot of great companies have communities within their um, you know uh, entities but now the uprise of the decentralized community where you know a lot of anonymous members become a part of a community and they are they are one of the amazing example is the crypto communities something that's happening in a lot of uh, discord servers is what they're trying to you know the tokenomics of these communities is that they're giving a percentage share of the equity to the community members in the very start Mm-hmm. So, so, so eventually a lot of these ambassadors and um, early adopters, or let's say um, uh, the, the, uh, you know, evangelist will hold a stake in the future of a community as well. Just wanted to um, know any of your thoughts about this new trend that is really coming up in 2020 and 2021. Yeah. Yeah. I, I quite did before in our conversation, community oftentimes feels like a startup. <laughs> How do startups recruit often? You know, they don't have the, the funds like, uh, like big tech companies have to pay engineers or you know, successful sales reps and all that. Sure. So that mechanism, what is it? It's equity, You're right? option stocks, right? Uh, so go into the community space. You know, how do you incentivize? Because you don't, you're not a corporation, you're not a company, you don't have shares to give. So yeah. you know, I think the, the idea of incentivizing people through you know, cryptocurrency, these coins, I, I think it's interesting. But I also want to, I also caution folks to understand that you know, a lot of communities, much like a lot of startups, they, they fail. Mm. They don't. So think about the, the bigger incentives and the reasons why you want to be part of a community. And, mm-hmm. vice, and on the flip side, as a, as a creator, as mm-hmm. a community builder, you really got to think about what is the real value of creating a, a coin as some basis of incentivization mm-hmm. uh, for building community. You know, because otherwise it, it almost sometimes feels like an like a MLL scheme. Mm-hmm. where mm-hmm. all you're doing is you're trying to bring on people into community because yeah. you want the value of the coin to increase. Yeah. And that's a very, that's it's, it's a very scammy. thin line. Yeah. Right. It's a very thin line. And you know, I see this a lot with like NFT communities. Yeah. And this is not the bash NFTs. I think there's super amazing value that, that can be provided for creators. Mm-hmm. But there's also folks that are coming into the NFT space and the crypto space that definitely don't have the best interest in mind of the mm-hmm. members of that community. Sure. And so you just got to, you from the outside looking at these communities, you really got to understand like, what is the long-term value? Like, what am I really getting out of this? As sure. opposed to just like a group of people getting like fanatical about a coin or <laughs> you know, some crazy gifs, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and just, and as a community builder, just be cognizant of, uh, the types of values that you're incentivizing and the type of culture you're creating. Sure. The culture should be about creating like real sustainable value for the community members mm-hmm. and whatever, for whatever topic that is yeah. uh, outside and much further and above that of creating value around a coin. <laughs> a coin is again, interesting as a part of that incentivization scheme. Mm-hmm. But think about the broader strokes of what you're trying to create and the value you're trying to add to this world. Awesome. And um, last few questions, Amak, is that what are your some of your favorite communities in the world? I mean, of course, you, AWS could be one of them. And, but I would just love to know any of the favorite uh, communities that you you really like or uh, love some of their, uh, you know, some of the narratives around those communities as well. Just like sure. to share it. Yeah. Yeah, I love what uh, Startup Grind has done. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dave Anderson, you know, now he has a company called Bevy, but it really started yeah. because uh, he wanted to get startup founders together. Sure. I think it's been so amazing to see how that's grown across the world and uh, all the enthusiasm. I'm a regular contributor to the Startup Grind blog, for example. I just mm-hmm. released uh, 
uh, topic uh, just uh, just yesterday on the difference between CTOs and VPs of engineering, mm -hmm. if anyone's curious. Yeah. Uh, so that's one I have a huge amount of respect for. Uh, another one is, is CMX itself. Mm -hmm. uh, because I think, you know, I started my journey as a community builder not knowing what I'm doing. Sure. And that was, I made tons of mistakes. Mm -hmm. And it's okay because I'm, you know, I have this kind of startup experimental mentality. I like to try things. Yeah. And it was okay because, yeah, from a, we have like this Amazonian thing where we talk about one way, two way doors. Mm -hmm. Like one way doors are decisions you make and you can't, you can't take them back. They're like big monumental decisions. Two way doors, you make a decision. If it goes wrong, you can always reverse course. So a lot of decisions that you make, in life are two-way doors. And that's kind of the way I, I look at things, but um, it would have been nice if I just had some folks I could talk to, to bounce ideas off of. And that's what CMX has really created over yeah. the years is a great, great community uh, for community builders. Yeah. Uh, and likewise, there's community club as well. Uh, there's a, if you're at all involved in community, those are two communities I would definitely definitely join and check out uh, and then one that's kind of more near dear my heart particularly from my days at stack uh mark i think i lost you i've learned a lot just in terms of how to think about content and how to think about uh speaking opportunities so uh, Mark, uh, sorry, uh, could you just say uh, the earlier part? I think I lost you for a few seconds, actually. My favorite part uh, when you're saying, yeah. Yeah, my favorite part uh, with uh, the DevRel community on Slack. Mm -hmm. It's uh, just a really great place to bounce ideas off of. And it works so, so well just in helping you out through any sort of ruts that you have. Because mm -hmm. uh, being, being in developer relations or being a developer advocate, Sure. Uh, it's kind of a more of a, a newer type of role and just having folks that are out there that are, are your peers sure. to work with. Again, it comes down to that one-to-one -one engagement value. Yeah. It's such a valuable community. So those are just like a few that for me come to mind. Absolutely. Thank you so much for the conversation, Mark. I absolutely would recommend a lot of our listeners to actually read your book as well, Community in a Box, especially for community mm -hmm. members and leaders. And uh, any any um, thoughts on if you're, any of your favorite books apart from the book that you have written yourself? Uh, do you have any of your favorite novels or books that you would recommend to your uh, listeners? I honestly have like uh, favorites, but uh, actually a few that I'm reading now. Oh pull them up here. Uh, I kind of read, you know, books kind of off and on. So this oh, is, range is a good range. one. David Epstein. Yeah. Right, with David Epstein. So I've been going into that. And then this other book, Centralism. This so Greg, Greg McCown, McEwen, mm -hmm. uh, really great book about how to reduce the things you're doing so that you focus your energies on the things that are going to be most high impact. Hmm. I think it's very easy for us, whether you're building community or a startup founder. Sure. Uh, like I talked to a lot of SaaS founders, obviously with AWS yeah. and a lot of their struggle and some of these struggles we talked about on Clubhouse is just trying to figure out like how to parcel out your day. Mm -hmm. So you're working on the things that, that move your, your SaaS startup forward. Sure. Because there are a lot of things you, you can go down a path that take up a lot of time and have zero impact. So essentialism is kind of a good book to help you to say no to a lot of things, mm -hmm. but not just for the, the sake of saying no, but to focus where you can do your best work. Got it. Thanks for those recommendations, Mark. Really love our con uh, conversation. I think our listeners will really love and take the value out of your thoughts as well. Thank you so much for your time and thanks for coming to our show as well. Yeah, uh, thank you, Sasha. It's been super awesome.